It is great to gather together. My name is Gary, and I'm just honored to be a part of this church and this, this team. And so today we're going to open the scriptures, and we're going to look in just a moment at uh, an anchor verse that we're using throughout this new series called Crushing It. And there was a, a man who had to take his uh, son with him to uh, the grocery store. And while he was at this, the grocery store, his son was in the, the terrible twos and he just wasn't having it. And if you've ever been to a grocery store with a child in their twos, you know what I'm talking about. The child was just way, wailing and you just, he just couldn't calm the child down very much. But he kept patting the, the, the little boy in the back and he kept saying, keep calm, Jonathan, keep calm. And he would go up and down the aisles while he was trying to pick up a few items. He'd say, keep calm, Jonathan, keep calm. There was this one customer. She saw him and she just wanted to encourage the man. And he said, he said sir, she said, sir, I just want to say how patient you're being with baby Jonathan. And the lady said, or the man said, said lady, I'm Jonathan. We all have little thoughts that fly through our heads at various times. Sometimes those thoughts are put in our mind by other people. Like this morning, uh, Pastor Dan uh, sent me a text message real early, and he said, really looking forward to today, you know? And so I decided to get inside Pastor Dan's head, and I said, um, yeah, is that this Sunday? I thought it was next week. <laughs> just, just for a little bit. So, so last week... Pastor uh, Dan talked uh, about how a changed mind can lead to a changed life. That our thoughts are like a main battleground that we all face every day. I've never met a person, and I suspect you haven't as well, I've never met a person who has lived their life without have any, having any battles in their thoughts. Whether you're whether you're filled with anxiety or, or you, you struggle with anger or maybe some type of addiction or despair or depression or guilt or shame or, or, or lust or self-image or, or worry. These are all things that are common to all of us. And so at our anchor verse is in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. And it talks about what God wants to do in all those thoughts that go through our mind every day. It says this, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. Pause. God wants to transform you. Even if you're watching this thing online, God wants to transform you into a new person. But how does he do that? He does it by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. What wins in your mind wins in your life. Lori and I were recently on a road trip, and while we're driving down the road, somewhere along, it hit, along the way it hit me, where has my mind been the last 50 miles? I don't even remember going that direction. Have you had that happen before too? Hopefully it's never happened during a sermon. <laughs> but Levi Lusco, who I enjoy listening to and reading occasionally, he says this, the kind of people we're going to become is shaped by the kind of thoughts we think each day. So you and I need to pay attention and learn and grow. And if you're not careful, you can learn something new every day. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. The Apostle Paul says this to a church who is struggling, a church that needs to grow and needs to mature. And he, he says, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Jump to chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, verse 20. He says this, brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. This all begs the question, what does someone who is mature, what are their thought processes? What kind of things go through their head all the time? What are the thoughts they allow to remain in their head? I read an article in Psychology Today, and experts say this, 
they study these things, not me, that we all have around 500 uninvited thoughts every day. These thoughts range in time, averaging around 14 or 15 seconds. But these thoughts tend to uh, be unwelcome, intrusive, and in some ways, they, they try to sort of dazzle our mind for a moment and, like a magnet, draw us downward rather than lift us upward. You think, well, that's not such a big deal, but do the math. If you multiply it out with 14 or 15 seconds and 500 thoughts, you're looking about right about two hours out of your only 16 or 17 hours awake each day, or if you have a two-year-old, 14 <laughs> hours, well, maybe 20 hours, okay. But think about this. We have these, these thoughts that are intrusive into our soul. Now, we know that Satan himself plants thoughts into our minds. We can read in the book of Acts how uh, a man named Ananias and Sapphira were coming before the apostle Peter. And Peter said, why has Satan filled your mind that you would lie to the Holy Spirit? We know Satan injects thoughts into us like this all the time. And some thoughts, maybe they're just a little bit of extra pizza. But sometimes those thoughts happen not just during the day, but they happen at night as well. I remember I was having a dream one time, and, and this person uh, suddenly showed up in my dream. And I thought that was odd. And suddenly, sound asleep, I heard a doorbell. And it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a real doorbell, but I heard a doorbell. It woke me up. I sat up. And I heard a voice as clear as I've heard any voice say, do not listen to the man that just walked into your dream. You know, sometimes I believe the Holy Spirit wants to help us to, to tune in to what God wants to say and speak to us in different ways. So my pastor used to say this all the time. He'd say, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head but you can keep them from building a nest there. So certainly the Bible's not written to be a psychology textbook, but it has more wisdom and insight for how we can allow our thoughts to honor and glorify God and to walk in a sense of victory. And if Jesus said it, I believe it. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 says this. In the New King James Version, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So that's point number one on your notes is really simply this. Anyone who belongs to Christ is a new creation. That means if you belong to Christ, you're brand new. If you belong to Christ... You're brand new. Personally, I am in awe of the beauty of creation. I love looking at the things that God creates. I, I'm just one of these guys that just carry the wow of God. I'm just, wow, God, that is so awesome. Everywhere I go. Now, the Bible tells us that God created the heavens and the earth. And then it says on the seventh day, he rested. But I believe God is still creating I believe God still creates. He creates every day. I believe God is creating right now. In, right in this moment, in this room, God is creating right now. And he's creating it inside of people. I believe Jesus is standing at the door. And he's knocking right now. And he's saying, if you will open the door, I will come in with you. And I will give you a brand new birth. And you will become a new creation. My father was career military, and I was born overseas. And it was quite a process my parents had to go through to get me a uh, United States birth certificate, um, assumedly because they expected me to end up being president. But they had a reason for that, and it was a process. But you see, Jesus creates a new birth in us, not an old piece of paper that will ever fade away, but something entirely new, a new life, a new creation. So in the Gospel of John, Jesus has this personal encounter with a man named Nicodemus. Everybody say Nicodemus. Nicodemus. 
Nicodemus. He was one of the most influential men in all of Israel during this particular time period. Uh, he was wealthy. He was powerful. He was a religious leader. He was a, me a member of the Pharisees, which was a very religious sort of sect of people. And Many of the Pharisees were being quite critical of Jesus. And Nicodemus, though, he and some companions or some other Pharisees, they were kind of open and curious a little bit about what Jesus is really all about. And so let's eavesdrop on their conversation just a little bit. It says now, in, starting in jo the Gospel of John, chapter 3 and verse 1, now there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. Uh, Here's this guy whose name means victory over the people, and he's got everything you could probably want, yet all his stuff, his power, his fame, his wealth, none of that is really making him happy. And so he came to Jesus at night. Everybody say, Nick, at night. <laughs> and he said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one, no one, key words, no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. Right. He said, we know. So he knows that Jesus is, is clearly understanding that there are some others, but they're, but they're just not quite settled yet. Right. So in reply, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'm going to shift the conversation a little bit. You said no one can do miracles. I'm not going to make it about me doing the miracles. I'm going to make it about you and what you might hear. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. No one, I'm making it about you now, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, Nicodemus, at this point, his head is probably spinning just a little bit. He's thinking, wait a second. I, obviously, I know a person can't be reborn. Are you trying to shock mock me here a little bit in some way, Jesus? Yeah. And in verse 4, Jesus responds this way. He says, how can a man, or Nicodemus responds, how can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time in his, into his mother's womb to be born. So, so Nicodemus is looking about, thinking about this on a natural level. But Jesus is talking about it on a spiritual level. So I want to invite you for a moment to try and think, not just on the natural level, but on the spiritual level. And if you have not yet given your heart to Christ, if he's doing this creating work in you right now at this moment, I want to invite you to think about this on a spiritual level, not just on a natural level. So he says, surely he cannot enter his mother's womb to be born. Now Jesus answers, but he's saying this birth happens both on the natural and on the spiritual level. Jesus answers that I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless, there's the no one again, unless he is born of water and of the spirit. Now I know... Uh, there's a variety of interpretations of this passage, and some would even say, well, the born of water refers to baptism. Perhaps it does, but my, my interpretation isn't quite that. I think if Jesus meant baptism, he would have said baptism. I think Jesus is comparing what, uh, he's comparing what happens in natural birth through the water of the womb, because if you look at verse 4, he says, can I enter a second time into his mother's womb? Jesus says, no. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water, still referring to the womb, and of the spirit, natural and spiritual. Verse 6, Jesus continues this theme. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. Jesus is saying there is a spiritual birth that must take place. And by the way, if you have a different view on that uh, passage than me, that's no problem. We don't necessarily all interpret the same way. I'm just sharing with you mine. Jesus says it's both a natural birth and a spiritual birth. Flesh gives birth to flesh. Spirit gives birth to spirit. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. I believe being born again is far more than just intellectual assent to a concept or idea. It's far more than just saying, yes, I, I, okay, yeah, well, I can see what you're thinking. 
Being born again is something that happens miraculous by God. It's something where he transforms from who you were into something entirely new. And if you're born again, I believe some point along the way, you'll have a spiritual birthday. My spiritual birthday was on a Wednesday night. It was April 20th, 1977. And it's very clear and very vivid to me. I know on that, t- on that day, something supernatural happened to me on the inside. Old things passed away and everything became brand new. Now, you could use different language there. Perhaps you use these terms interchangeably, such as uh, accepted Christ or received Jesus as Savior or made a decision for Christ or asked Jesus to come into your heart or you were born again or you became a believer or, or any one of a number of expressions. Maybe you say, I became a, a convert to Christ or I gave my life to Christ or maybe you say, I got saved at that point. Whatever the language is, the in- insight is the same. Jesus gives you a spiritual new birth. And the only person that can know if that's true or not is you. Have you been born again? 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, as by his great mercy, not by our great deeds, by his great mercy we have been born again. So we don't inherit this new nature from our parents. We don't decide to recreate ourselves. God didn't simply clean us up a little bit and give us, uh, let us keep our old nature. God didn't merely give us a get out of jail card, but rather he gave us entire, something entirely fresh and unique, something new. If anyone belongs to Christ, they are a new creation. See, real life starts not with just turning over a new leaf, but the birthing of a new life, something brand new. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 10, it says this. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. Talking about Jesus. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. That is one of the hardest verses in the Bible for me, how painful that is. He came to his own, and they didn't even receive him. Verse 12, but to all who believed and accepted him, there's different language, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, again, not with the physical birth, it says in verse 13, there's the natural, which was, results from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. You see, we don't believe in life after death, we believe in life after birth. Point number two, anyone who is a new creation has a new story. Man, the things that used to be, the, the anger, the, the adulterous ways, the, the, the selfishness, the pride, the arrogance, those things have passed away. And it says, all things have become new. I love the smell of new. Don't you? Just when I say that, you can, you can think about it. What, I'm, I'm sure what comes to, well, I won't even get into that. The smell of new. It is such a wonderful, wonderful, tangible smell that pops into our memory. The Bible seems to be a new book when you're a new creation. All things have become new. Suddenly you have this sense of wonder. It's brand new. Suddenly you love to gather with others and worship Jesus. That is brand new. Man, you have this new desire to share Jesus with others. It's brand new. You have this new joy, this new peace, this new love and compassion for people that you used to be willing to say, get out of my way. Suddenly you have this new desire to long, uh, new longing to to know God and to have fellowship with him. You have this new readiness to forgive other people who've offended you. Oh, there's something wonderful about being a new creation. Point number three is this. Everyone who is a new creation lives in Christ and Christ lives in them. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation in Christ. I've had people ask me over the years, what is the greatest insight you know of for walking with Christ over the long haul? 
There are a lot of things I would tell them. I would, I would right away say, develop a daily time of prayer with Jesus. I would tell them, um, read the word and, and actually take the word and, and commit, commit it to memory and hide it in your heart. I would say, have fellowship with other Christians. But this one is possibly one of the most powerful keys I've ever known to walking with Jesus. And it's simply this, discover the secret of living in Christ. In Christ. What does that really mean? I believe your blueprint for crushing it in your thoughts is to remind your mind that you are, if you're a Christian, you are in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, we are God's masterpiece. Some of your versions might say handiwork. He has created, there's the new birth, he has created us anew, everybody say it with me, in Christ. He's created us anew in Christ so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. The life of one who is in Christ is not one of self-improvement or reformation. The life of one who is in Christ is not merely rearranging our mental furniture or clearing out an hour on Sunday that God can work in, that we can kind of work God in. Rather, one who is in Christ has died to an old life and has been reborn to a new life. Aren't you glad this church isn't called old life? <laughs> Come on. Galatians 2.20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but say these words with me, Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's an, that's an entirely different wrinkle in this mystery. Think about it. It says, but Christ lives in me. I thought you just said, Gary, that, that we live in Christ. Ah, this is the beautiful mystery. We live in Christ, but Christ lives in us. Man, that's, that's a head scratcher. Picture a bottle in the ocean. It's in the water, but the water's in the bottle. We live in Christ, but Christ lives in us. Grab your shirt and do like I do sometimes. Hey, Jesus, you in there? Come on, try it. You in there, Jesus? Need anything? John chapter 15 and verse 4. Jesus says, remain in me and I also remain in you. We live in Christ and he lives in us. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It has to remain in the vine. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Branches. We live in Christ while Christ lives in us. This next three verses are three of my top 10 favorite verses in the Bible. I don't read them in this version uh, most of the time because I learned them in another version, but I want to keep calm, Jonathan. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> For those of you that are listening to this streaming, there was a baby crying in here, never mind. <laughs> Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Amen. Verse 2, think about, everybody say think about, yeah. think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22, it says, Throw off your old sinful life, which is corrupted by lust and deception, thoughts. Instead, let the Spirit, Holy Spirit, capital S, renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on this new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Just because a certain thought pops into my head does not mean that's who we are. Now, what I do... When the enemy comes and he tempts me with, with pride, I, I, I stop and I say, that's not who I am. I say those words out loud. 
And when he tempts me with greed, I say, that's not who I am. When he tempts me with lust or, or, or selfishness, I say, that's not who I am. When he tempts me to feel sorry for myself, I say, that's not who I am. And so to that end, I want to do something that uh, a pastor probably never does. And I, I want to say, if you have your phone, get out your phone. And there's a QR code on your notes there. I want you to, uh, to click on the QR code that, that basically says uh, the who I am in Christ verses. And you can download that to your device so you have it. But that'll take you directly to the website and you'll see this list of verses. And these are verses that I use regularly over and over again because they remind me who I am in Christ. And if I knew who I am in Christ, I begin to crush it in my thoughts. I begin to crush it in my mind because my mind is not my own. If you're looking at it, on the screens there won't be numbered, but if you're looking at it on your device, there will be. And so look at number one. It says, I am a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Look at number three, 1 John 5, and say it out loud with me. I am born of God and the evil one cannot touch me. Read the next one. I am delivered from the power of darkness and translated into Christ's kingdom. Look at number five. It says, I have the greater one living in me. 1 John 4.4 4 says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. I begin to read some of these verses out loud and my spirit begins to swell. I become stronger. I become mightier because I'm reading what the Bible says about who I am in Christ. Now, most of the time, anything I preach about is about who he is. But right now, I'm talking about who the Bible says we are. And if we don't understand and receive and accept and let our mind dwell on who the Bible says we are, we become easy pickings for the enemy of our soul. Second Timothy chapter two, number six, read it with me. I do not have a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sand mind. The next one, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. I love it. I love 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. It says, I am a partaker of his divine nature. Wow. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, I have the mind of Christ. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, it says, I have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. I think on things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report. Whatever has excellent or worthy of praise, I think about those things. I'm holy and without blame before him in love. I can approach God with freedom and confidence. 1 Corinthians 3 says, I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. If you have Christ living in you, you're a temple of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 15, it's number 16 on your list. Jesus says, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. I am a friend of God. 1 Peter 2, 9, in, in number 19 on your list, says, I'm a part of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. I'm a part of God's royal family. Earlier, uh, when we were having prayer before service, Pastor Dan said, take a look at Romans 8. And man, he's so right. I, I would study all of Romans 8 today if you're going to do anything today, you can watch a football game if you're into that. All right, I admit it. My wife is chuckling. Yeah, I'm, I'm into that. But I am more into the Word of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 17, it says that, that we are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, sharing in his inheritance. Jump down to 25. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6, it says, I'm raised up with Christ and seated with him in heavenly places. Yes. Romans chapter 8 again, oh my goodness. For who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble or hardship or nakedness or peril or sword or danger 
knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things in the present, nor things in the future, nor any other powers, neither height, nor depth, or anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we can come boldly before his throne of grace, be fully submitted to him. And I'm confident that he who has begun a good work in you will finish it. Stand with me in prayer, if you would, please. So this morning, we've talked about being born again as a new creation. There are some here right now, God is working on your heart, and you say, I've been around church for a while. You may have been attending church for years, but you've never had that spiritual birthday, that point at which you could look and say, man, today's the day. I, I, I just feel God knocking on the door of my heart. Jesus says, I'm standing there knocking. All you got to do is open the door. Would you open the door to him today, right now? He loves you. He wants to cleanse you. He wants to forgive you of all your sins. He wants to make things brand new. If you're watching this somewhere else at home, I want you to know that right now at this moment, Jesus wants to do a miracle inside of you and give you a brand new heart, a brand new life. Make it a brand new day. I want to invite you right now. If you want to give your life to Jesus right where you're at, I asked everybody to do this earlier, but right now I just want to ask, if you want to give your life to Jesus, put your hand over your heart one more time, wherever you are. You want to give your life to Jesus today. Today's your day. There's lots of people with their hand over their heart all across this place. Hand over their heart that are watching this. I want you to, everyone to repeat this prayer after me. And I believe as we pray this prayer, God is going to miraculously transform people in this room right now. New hearts are going to be born. Father God, right now, I give my life to you. I turn away from sin. I turn towards you. Make me a new person. Make me spiritually reborn. Let old things pass away and everything become brand new. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Hallelujah.